Hey guys, welcome back to the show. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, before we jump in, I wanted a couple of things I wanted to leave with you. Number one, I want to encourage you guys to leave us a review on whatever platform you happen to be listening to this podcast on, whether it's Spotify or Apple, anywhere. Um, those reviews are really how this podcast gets seen and how we're able to reach more people. Secondly, if you get value from this episode, please make sure that you share it out with your friends, your networks, anybody else who you think would also benefit from it. And number three, last but not least, just a reminder to head over to natnidham.com and make sure to sign up for my newsletter, because that's how you'll get to find out about all of the different things that um, I'm loving these days. I share about a lot of different products, but also I talk about some of the events that I'm involved in, uh, some of the summits, and some of the live events that I'll be at this spring that you can join me at as well. One of them being the Hack Your Health Conference in Austin at the end of May, and the other being the Health Optimization. Summit in London in June. Okay, osteoporosis. This is often a condition reserved for older people, specifically women. But did you know that it can also affect young people as well as men? Protecting bone health can start at a young age if we continue to discuss the importance of it, as Kevin Ellis and I do in this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast. In this conversation with Kevin, the bone coach, we explore the world of bone health and bone disease. Osteoporosis is affecting more and more people at younger ages due to the sedentary lives with low nutrient diets that society leads. Kevin himself has a fascinating story of his own journey in this. We dive into the standard recommendations that follow an osteoporosis diagnosis, as well as the medication side effects and long-term results of these procedures. Most medications require even more follow-up medications. So knowing what you're getting into is important when selecting the route that you want to take and that is right for you. Natural bone restoration is an option for those who don't want to blindly follow the medication route. But you've got to make sure you know what you're doing here. So overall, this conversation offers guidance on exercise, nutrition, and gut health procedures for building and maintaining quality bone tissue for longevity. Kevin Ellis is an integrative nutrition certified health coach, osteoporosis thriver, and founder of The Bone Coach. He has made it his mission to help over a million people around the globe address bone loss, build bone strength, stop fearing fractures, and to lead active lives. He's most famous for helping people with osteopenia and osteoporosis gain clarity and confidence that improvement is possible and helping them to achieve that very improvement. So now to learn more about Kevin and the many programs he offers, you can go to bonecoach.com or check him out on Instagram at bonecoachkevin. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Kevin Ellis, it's a pleasure to have you back. Well, actually, it's a pleasure to see you again, although it's the first time you've been on my show. Welcome. <laughs> Matt, thanks for having me. This is going to be a great conversation. Yeah, I loved our last conversation that we had on my podcast. Yeah, totally. And uh, that was a super fun conversation. And I've been like, ever since then, I've been like, oh, I can't wait to be on the other side of the mic with this guy. Um, and we're going to talk about a topic that is critically important um, to human health and longevity, both in the present and down the road. And that is all about your bones. Um, and if anybody's watching this, the dead giveaway is Kevin's t-shirt, the bone coach. So, you know, the man walks the talk, walks the walk, talks the talk, does the, lives the life. So just just as a brief introduction into you and who you are and why you do what you do, like how the heck did you ever get into this? Like, you know, usually guys are like they're trainers and this and that. So yeah, what, yeah. When you think about bone health, when, <laughs> when you think about bone health and osteoporosis, you're not thinking about the young male, right? You're thinking about the woman later in life. Maybe you remember a grandma who had a fracture or a mother or someone like that that had an injury from from weakened bones. For me, my journey started when I was a lot younger. I was in the Marines. I came out of the Marine Corps. I had a lot of digestive issues. I was diagnosed with celiac disease. Mm. Celiac disease, obviously an autoimmune condition where when you ingest gluten, it damages the villi in your small intestine, those tiny little nutrient absorption centers, and it blunts them to where they can't do their job. So for me, my body still needed these nutrients, especially calcium, the primary mineral constituent of your bones, 
to execute its daily functions and I wasn't absorbing it. So my body was going to my skeleton and pulling from there and that was leading to bone loss and a subsequent diagnosis of osteoporosis right around 30 years old. So I had this, um, you know, my, my father, he passed away really young. I didn't want to go down that same path. I wanted to be there for my kids. So I had a strong impetus to make improvements and changes. And I became, uh, I, not only did I get the right plan in place for me, I became a coach. I built out a team. Now we've got hundreds of thousands of people in a community helping them build stronger bones uh, at bonecoach.com. And it's just, it's been an awesome experience so far. I love that story. You know, you just blew two myths right out of the water, right? Number one, that osteoporosis is an old person's problem. And number two, that osteoporosis and osteopenia are is a women's problem. And you just like, in two minutes, <laughs> blew that up. And I think you bring up such a good point, right? So not being able to absorb your nutrients, prop break down your nutrients properly and absorb them was a massive issue, which actually, before we dive into the meat of the episode, I think that brings up another topic, which is another huge subset of people that are at risk for bone density issues, as well as cardiovascular disease. And I know you know where I'm going with this, is people on PPIs. So Absolutely. proton pump inhibitors, um, and a lot of them, I mean, there's a lot of women, but many men um, who suffer from digestive, from GERD, from heart re from reflu heartburn and reflux, get put on PPIs by their docs. And maybe, you know, I mean, I can outline it, but you're the guest. So why don't you talk about, you know, why, how PPIs play into long-term issues for, and this is for men and women again. Yeah. So antacid, the antacids are they're drugs that reduce the production of or increase the suppression of your stomach acid right so this would be your proton pump inhibitors your ppis or your h2 receptor antagonist drugs so like your ranitidine your zantac those kinds of things ppis would be omeprazole nexium prevacid you hear those names that's mm -hmm. what that is now a lot of those drugs should not be taken ever and if they are they are only taken for a very short period of time a lot of people that i see they're on them for decades, yeah, decades 100%. at a time. And what that's doing is it's that that's reducing that stomach acid. Now you need stomach acid to properly break down and extract nutrients from your food, like amino acids, the building blocks of protein, your bones are 50% protein by volume. They need amino acids, um, calcium, magnesium, iron, B12. If you have low stomach acid, your body, your bones are going to be starved of these nutrients. So you need to you need to wean yourself off of PPIs uh, if if you're on them. I mean, obviously, discuss that with your physician. Figure that out with with a practitioner that can help you with that. But that would be a great idea, and then get that stomach acid back up to where it needs to be because you need good stomach acid function. Yeah, a hundred percent. I'll never forget how shocked I was when I read some studies that talked about how PPIs were originally designed to be used for six weeks at most. They were used. They were designed to be used as a strategy to allow for a certain degree of healing. And like it, it was supposed to be an interim thing. And instead it's become the solution to, oh, we can shut down that stomach acid. You won't have to worry about a thing kind of strategy. So, okay. So and, and a lot of people take yeah. it. And a lot of people take those drugs because they think they have too much stomach acid. When in reality, they, they actually have, have too little, right? 100%. They have too little stomach acid. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. I mean, we have a big agenda, so I want to I want to keep us moving. For here. Sure. Let's um, we've just both of us at different times so far in this five minute conversation have mentioned osteoporosis and osteopenia. So maybe let's define for people what those two things are and how they're different. Yeah. So osteoporosis means porous bones, and it's a condition that's characterized by either not enough bone formation, excessive bone loss, or it's a combination of the two of those things. And in osteoporosis, both your bone density and your bone quality are reduced, and that's going to increase your risk of fracture. Now, the way you find out you have osteoporosis, you get this diagnosis, is through what's called a bone density scan. Mm -hmm. You go, you get this scan, you lay down on a machine, it does a scan, it tells you the actual mineral content of your bone, your bone mineral density. And then it generates a score. And that score, if it's plus one or minus one, that's going to be considered normal and healthy. If it's minus one to minus 2.5, that's considered osteopenia. We would call that low bone mass. Mm -hmm. And that is like a precursor to osteoporosis. Right. And osteoporosis is minus 2.5 and lower. So minus 2.6, minus 2.7, so on and so forth. The greater the negative number becomes, the more severe the osteoporosis. Now, uh, most people aren't getting these scans until later in life. 
Their insurance isn't covering them till later. They're not asking their physicians, especially for women around menopause, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Primary osteoporosis is, it typically occurs as a result of a decrease in estrogen in postmenopausal women. So right around that time in life, uh, there can be a significant drop off in bone density. If you're not aware of this, you're not monitoring it. Uh, Maybe you're not on bioidentical hormone replacement therapy, something like that. You can have this steep decline of bone density during that time. A lot of people aren't aware of this or they're not monitoring it and they don't get these scans done at that time. And I always encourage people get these scans done, get a baseline earlier in life. Yeah. You're you're reaching peak bone mass right around 30 years old. So 90% of your bone mass put on by the time you turn age 18. Remaining 10% fills in by the time you turn about 30. So you just be aware that if you can get a baseline right around that peak bone mass period around 30 years old, then you can monitor f- future changes from that. So if you have big changes or drops, or maybe you'll just know you didn't reach peak bone mass to begin with. Yeah. Because if yeah. when you were younger uh, and if you have kids or grandkids, this is really important. So pay attention to this is uh, if you led a sedentary lifestyle, if you weren't uh, if you smoked or drank excessively if you had a poor diet and nutrition you were drinking a bunch of sugary soft drinks eating a bunch of candy like i was when i was a kid i grew up in the midwest right macaroni is a vegetable where i was growing <laughs> up so like I, not all the time it wasn't say everything was bad but there was a good enough amount of those things that were probably affecting my development at that time so if you've got young kids we want to make sure we're getting good vitamin D, vitamin K2, magnesium, calcium, get them the the good foundational elements to build strong, healthy bones from when they're young. And also get them doing exercise, get them off the tablets, get them out of the house, get them out running around outside, playing sports, soccer, gymnastics, you know, whatever, moving their body and their bones in these short, sharp, dynamic movements when they're young, that's going to build a good, healthy, quality bone structure that can add 10, 20, 30 years onto their life later on. Nice. I love that. And I mean, you know, and I think when you were saying calcium, magnesium, D3, K2 for kids, you're not talking about necessarily taking vitamins. It's just eat real food, guys. Like just get your meat, get your vegetables and your meat and your chicken and your fish, like get those things in. And, you know, a lot of people talk about dairy being a pillar of bone health, which it's a dairy is a bit of a double-edged sword. There's a lot of kids, even kids who don't tolerate dairy. So don't get too hung up on it. It can be helpful in the right context, but it's not a must. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. So dairy can be great if it's right for you, if it works for you. But if you have an autoimmune condition that you're trying to put into remission, or you have some other condition you're trying to navigate, or you just don't tolerate it, then it might not be a good fit. Right. But if you are going to consume dairy or your kids are going to consume dairy, Try to go uh, as natural as you possibly can in cultured and fermented forms. So getting 24-hour yogurt. I know it takes a little bit longer to make something like that, but the result is fantastic. Also kefir. Mm -hmm. Kefir can be a great addition too. Um, And then you don't just have to use A2 organic regenerative cow's milk. You could go with camel or sheep or something like that too. So there are options that you have there if that's even part of your plan. No, I love that. And I, I love that you brought up camel milk. I, it's so funny. I, it hasn't been in my, um, I haven't even thought about camel milk in years. There used to be a guy that used to come to the biohacking shows with a camel. And he I was, have some. You do? I so, have some in the freezer, it's, it's yeah. It's amazing, right? And it is an incredibly, Salty. yeah, it's, it's got a different texture and taste, but it actually is shockingly nutritious for humans and, mm-hmm. and not allergic fairly hypoallergenic. Um, but you know, one thing I, I, we underestimate sometimes is kids can definitely be lactose intolerant. Um, and I remember talking to a teacher at my kid's school once when he was in elementary school and she knew I was a nutritionist at the time. And she said, Oh my God, pizza day is the worst day. She goes, we give these poor little kids pizza at noon. And by two o'clock in the afternoon, they're tooting, they have no energy, they're bloated. (laughs) I mean, nobody thinks of little, you know, like you, you just don't think of that as a thing. So, you know, as a parent, be be aware and be mindful that, you know, the, the dairy might be great for your child, but 
yeah. make make sure that it really is because otherwise it's going to be just as bad for them as it is for anybody else, if for any adult. Okay, so when somebody gets a diagnosis from a medical diagnosis of osteoporosis or osteopenia, let's let's go two ways here. We mm-hmm. have our, our allopathic conventional medical doctor here, and then we're going to have the other direction. And, um, yeah. you know, I know my mom got a diagnosis early on. She was told to take a certain medication. She looked up the side effects and she's like, crossed her arm. And she's very funny. She crossed her arm. She's like, nope, 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 not doing that. Not going there. So um, maybe you can give people some insight into why that might be, might've been a really good answer from her. <laughs> yeah, no, let's go both paths. So let's talk about the the standard treatment recommendation that 90%, 95% of people that I talk to are getting, yeah. which is take some calcium, take some vitamin D, go for a walk. Here's your bone drug. We'll see you in two years for your next bone density scan. That's the standard recommendation for 90% of people that get this diagnosis. Uh, and then we'll also talk about the natural route too. And so going the standard treatment recommendation. So just know that if you're going into a conventional physician, that the end of that conversation is probably going to lead to the recommendation for a pharmaceutical if you get this diagnosis. And these are drugs that have a dramatic effect on bone physiology. It's not like taking an aspirin. And there are different categories of drugs. There are anti-resorptives, there are anabolics. Anti-resorptives are designed to slow down the activity level of cells that break down bone. Can they do that? Of course they can. Are there risks, side effects, short and long-term implications of use? Absolutely. So within anti-resorptives, there are bisphosphonates and rank ligand inhibitors. Bisphosphonates, a lot of people have heard of those. Fosamax, Reclasp, mm-hmm. uh, Boniva, Actinel. Those are bisphosphonates. The safety and efficacy of bisphosphonates is not really well known beyond five years. And as you and I and everyone else going going about our daily lives, doing daily activities, doing chores around the house, working out, you, you know, playing with the kids, the grandkids out in the garden, all those kinds of things, they start to create these tiny little micro cracks and fractures in our bones, little micro fractures. That's normal. Okay. That happens for everyone. And then you have cells within the bone called mm-hmm. osteocytes that sense that damage and they send out a signal. They say, hey, we need to become stronger. So there are other cells that pick up that signal, osteoclasts, and they come in and scoop out that damaged bone. And right behind it, it's a coupled process. There are osteoblasts that come fill, build stronger, healthier new bone, blast build. And that's a normal process. And it's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. You're supposed to have this. And when when you take some of these medications, especially for too long, multiple years, you can slow down that activity level too much to where you start to accumulate that old, worn, damaged, weakened bone. So even if you're taking one of these medications and it shows these, these anti-resorptives and it shows that your, your bone density is actually higher, the quality may not actually be there. It may not be stronger. So bone density, I talked about the bone density scan. When you get that scan, most people only have part of the picture. They only have that bone density part, the mineral content of the bone. But there's another part of your bone that's important. That's quality. Mm-hmm. Quality is the structural integrity, the microarchitecture, how that bone is organized. Those two things combine to create bone strength. So a lot of times, most people only have part of the picture. Now you can, at the time of dying, uh, or before you get your bone density scan, you can get the quality part of the picture too, If you call ahead to a facility, ask them if they have TBS technology, trabecular bone score technology, that can help you give uh, or get the quality part of the picture. There's also another technology that is more prevalent in Europe right now, not surprising, Mm -hmm. uh, that is having a harder time making its way into the US. And that is uh, called REMS, radio frequency echographic multispectrometry technology. And it is used in a device called Echolite. And this can look, it's an ultrasound technology that looks at bone density, bone quality, and gives you a five-year predictor of, of fractures. So uh, it that's another tool. Like there are ways to find out your bone quality. And you can see just how important bone quality is, is in that picture. And there is one other piece of information 
that is really important for people to understand if they really truly want to understand what's going on inside their bones right now. And those are bone turnover markers. Mm -hmm. So these are tests that look at the activity level of cells that are breaking down and building up your bone. So the most sensitive marker for bone resorption or breakdown is called uh, serum CTX, C2 peptide test. That test looks at the activity level of cells that are breaking down bone. And if that activity level is elevated or even really high, that can be an indicator of active bone loss and a root cause issue that needs to be addressed. Okay. Now, if we're looking at bone resorption breakdown, we also want to look at formation. You don't just want to look at one side of the picture. You need both. Yeah. Let's look at formation too. So the most sensitive marker for bone formation is P1NP, pro-collagen type 1 N-terminal propeptide. And that looks at the activity level of cells that are building up your bone. So then you can look at those numbers, you look at the ratio, and, and you want to see those things improve over time too. So you can see improvements in those in three to six month periods. And you now don't have to guess what's going on in between your DEXA scans that are probably a year, year and a half, two years or more out. Yeah. So. And you brought up an interesting, you said something very interesting there, collagen. And I think that you know, people very often will focus on strong bones, but I think what they forget, and one of the shortcomings, I believe, of, Fosam of things like Fosamax is it creates brittle bones. Um, and one of the components of bone that we under discuss and under stress sometimes is collagen, in that bone needs to be flexible to a degree so that it doesn't break, so that it can you can apply the pressure that stimulates the osteoblast to do their thing, uh, without it kind of shattering on you. Um, and I do think that again, like when we're, th when people are thinking about their bones, yes, you want bones that are strong, but they need to be flexible at the same time. And that yeah. collagen piece is really, really important. It really is. Uh, remember I said, your bones are 50% protein by volume. That's a collagen protein matrix structure upon which minerals are, are, are laid. So, it, it's a mixture of collagen, a mixture of minerals. That's what's going to make bone strong and healthy and flexible and, and dense. And you want the right combination of that too. Perfect. Uh, and one thing that can be really helpful for this, uh, when, if we're talking about nutrients specifically, mm -hmm. vitamin C is actually really important for the health of your skeleton. Yeah. Because just like we talked about, collagen is part of that protein matrix structure. Well, vitamin C stimulates pro-collagen it enhances collagen synthesis and it stimulates alkaline phosphatase activity, which is a marker for bone building cell formation. And then on the opposite side of that, if you don't get enough vitamin C, especially long-term, mm -hmm. that can increase the risk of fracture too. So uh, it's really, really important to make sure you're incorporating that into your plan. A hundred percent. And you had such an interesting point on vitamin C. I had a teacher in school that said vitamin C for collagen. And I never forgot that because, you know, vitamin C, people always think, oh, I'm getting a cold. I need to take vitamin C. Yeah, but I mean, for collagen, I mean, for skin, for bones, for, for all connective tissue is really important. Okay. So you talked about the one class of medication. Is there a second class of medication that an alternate route that people are directed towards? There is. Um, so actually, even within anti-resorptives, there's another category called rank ligand inhibitors, mm -hmm. and this would be Prolia. This is one that a lot of people have probably heard about if they're at this, this decision point, or maybe your mother or grandmother is at the decision point. So uh, if you are taking Prolia, an important note is that if you take this drug, you can't just come off it. You can't just stop. Right. Because if you do, you risk uh, a rebound fracture. So when you stop taking the medication, you yeah. have this swarm of osteoclasts that that um, that basically increase their activity very, very quickly, and that can lead to uh, a, a vertebral fracture. So you basically have to, if you're taking in uh, an anti-resorptive like Prolia, you have to relay off it with a bisphosphonate just to not have that rebound fracture. So does right? it just so, suppress? Does it just suppress the the osteoclast? Yeah, it's slowing down the activity level of cells that are breaking down bone. So, um, and but if somebody has taken three rounds or more of Prolia, so one round of Prolia is about six months. If you've taken three rounds of it, eighteen months, you you can't just relay with any old bisphosphonate. 
you have to use reclass, which is the strongest one. It's an IV infusion, uh, bisphosphonate. So these are nuanced things that a lot of people do not know when they start taking these medications. So if you know, if you're in this situation or you know a parent or someone else who is, ask them. And then remember, come back to this episode and go through what I just shared there. So let's talk about now the other category of medication that doctors are going to propose. And these are called anabolics. Mm -hmm. Now, anabolics are designed to build bone, build better quality bone and build it faster. This would be your Forteo, your Timlos, your Avenity. Can they do that? Of course they can. And a lot of times they're recommended to patients who have poor quality bone yeah. and who have already fractured multiple times, especially if it's low trauma or no trauma. That's the patient that is going to get recommended this drug. Now, look, I am pro do everything you possibly can naturally before ever considering medication as an option. So that's what we teach. We teach a natural approach in our programs too. At the same time, I can't be anti-medication because I have seen situations where it's necessary and life-saving for some people. So sometimes anabolics make sense. Um, <clears throat> but if you take one, just know you own, there's only a certain period of time you can take that, 12, uh, 12 months, 24 months, something like that. And then you have to follow it with an anti-resorptive just to not lose the bone you just gained. Okay. So again, you're committing, you're usually going to commit to a medication, not just one medication. It's going to be multiple medications for many, many years, if not a lifetime, once you start. So with the anabolics, wouldn't it make sense that you could, and I'm curious about this actually, if you're, you have someone that gets prescribed an anabolic and as well as with lifestyle and diet interventions. So increase your exercise, like change your life, right? So now you're going to start doing weight bearing exercise. If you, if you're completely sedentary, if you're not sedentary, then maybe we start loading you up and thinking about heavy weightlifting or getting into a gym, um, like even like an osteo strong where they're going to apply significant load to the bones to really stimulate them to build. And you, and you correct for diet and supplementation and stuff. Do you still have to use the 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 second medication? Like, can the can the anabolic just not do its thing and kind of give people a leg up? Good, good question. Because there are people that come come to me that they have just taken an anabolic and and they just said, yeah, I just stopped. I just stopped taking it. I didn't want to take anything else. I didn't want to follow it. That's not a good decision. Okay. Um, if you are taking an anabolic medication number one, you monitor it with bone turnover markers. You mm -hmm. look at the activity level of those cells, you see where they're at. Is that osteoclast activity really high when you look at that serum CTX? Is it 700, 800, 900 higher? If it is, that needs to come down, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yes, you can obviously do nutritional interventions. You can be exercising. You can resolve your digestive issues. You can do all the holistic stuff. But once you've already had that medication intervention, it's really hard to just say, yeah, I'm just going to immediately go, you know, cold yeah. turkey to a hundred percent natural approach. Cause you've already, you've already messed with that, um, with that bone physiology there. So, um, I, I think it's important to, especially if you're on prolia, don't just stop cold turkey, especially if you're on anabolic, don't just stop cold turkey. You can relay off of those medications properly to where you don't have to take them again. Obviously, you wouldn't just use this conversation to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you would talk to your doctor, you would monitor your bone turnover markers, but um, just be aware. Just if you've already done that, don't just stop cold turkey. Right, and I think that to your point that you brought up when you started with the anabolics is sometimes someone is at a point where there's been too much degradation to just go fully natural, mm -hmm. right? So in a perfect world, you've gotten your you've gotten your baselines done when you're even in your thirties, um, just understand what's your founding, what's your starting point on your bone density. Every few years, you're going to monitor, you're going to stay active, you're going to do the things and you avoid kind of coming off that cliff. It's a little bit like the pre-diabetes type two diabetes conversation, right? If we can avoid yeah. hitting, hitting the edge of the cliff in the first place, then we're, we're always going to benefit from that. So when we're talking about natural approaches, which I guess is where we're going next, unless there's another class of drugs we want to talk about. Um, 
what what are the guidelines of going with a more natural approach? Like if you have someone who obviously has already lost a lot of bone mass, yeah, what is the best way for them to to address this? And or you have a premenopausal or perimenopausal woman, her estrogen's tanking, her bones are kind of, you know, starting to show signs of going the wrong way. That's going to be a different protocol. So maybe we can just speak to those two scenarios. Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is what might be in people's minds is you can build bone without medication. You yeah, can yeah. do that. It's possible. Okay. And, and you can also use bioidentical hormone replacement therapy that can play a role. So estrogen has a protective effect on bone, uh, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, those can help with building bone too. Uh, you would obviously work with a practitioner to see if it's right for you first and what, what makes the most sense for you. There's not just a blanket protocol for that. Uh, so that's really important to know. But then from a, a natural approach, some of the most important foundations that you have to follow or you know have to be lined up, diet, nutrition, gut health, and exercise. I mean, that's one of the biggest, most important pieces. So let's just start with, um, we'll start with gut health because we kind of talked about that at the beginning. Yeah. But I, I do want to make another connection to bone here that most people don't realize uh, it, when it comes to their gut health. So we talked about absorption. I talked about celiac disease, my personal journey with that having an autoimmune condition, damaged the villi, couldn't absorb the nutrients, body went to the skeleton, pulled the minerals, osteoporosis, right? That's a, that's actually a common situation. So if you're listening to this and you have ulcerative colitis, if you have Crohn's disease, if you have celiac disease, or you know someone who has any of those conditions, especially celiac disease, you should have them ask their physician to run a bone density scan on them. Because I, I thought, oh, I'm a tough Marine. No way. My bones are going to be just fine. Nope. Wasn't the case. Even if they're young. Yeah. Even if you're young, especially right around that time of peak bone mass, 30, 30 and up. I, I even see people in their late 20s too. Mm -hmm. um, but at, have them ask their physicians to do that. Get the bone density scan, get the test. That way you at least have a baseline. You know where you're at. Uh, so from a digestive issue perspective, we know to resolve those digestive issues, you got to make some dietary changes and reduce your stress. Those are some of them and, and get some sleep. Those are the most important things for resolving those. And you have to go 100% gluten-free for uh, for celiac disease. There's no cheating. No, no none sense of about, about Yeah, there's yeah, no negotiation even, there. Don't even try. Don't even just sample. Not, not even worth it. 100% gluten-free. No uh, for the rest of your life. And then, uh, so that's the absorption piece. Now, the other part of this is that your bones are not just these static tissues that hold you upright and carry you through life. They do that. They do a really good job of it, but they also are living tissue. They're endocrine organs. And within your bones, you have bone marrow. Bone marrow is this soft, spongy material that produces 95% of the blood cells in your body. So if you need help with preventing bleeding and clotting, um, platelets are going to help with that. If you need help with carrying oxygen to the body's tissues, carrying carbon dioxide away from the tissues back to the lungs, red blood cells are going to help with that. If you need help with fighting infections and healing wounds or anything related to the immune system, white blood cells are going to help with that. Now, the cells that break down bone, osteoclasts, are form of white blood cell. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anything that is related to the immune system or stimulating the immune system is speaking in the same language as the cells that break down bone. Where does 70% of your immune system reside? In your gut, right? So it's not just a matter of resolving digestive issues just for absorption. That is important, but it's also, are those digestive issues stimulating the immune system, speaking in the same language as the cells that break down your bone, contributing to bone loss, and osteoporosis. So you have to resolve those digestive issues. So, so important. Yeah. Yeah. It starts in the gut hundred yep. percent. Then we get into diet nutrition uh, and I won't go too, too deep in this, but I'll cover some big pillars. I would say yeah. protein, prioritize protein, get your protein in at your meals. 30 grams would be a great minimum target as a, as a, for, for meals. And also if you already have issues with your bones and you're trying to, uh, build your bones up, one meal a day is not going to cut it. Okay. Yeah. I know sometimes people, you know, they're, they're fasting or they want to do extended fasting. And I know that can be a tool, 
right? That can help with inflammation and, and it can be a strategic tool at different points. But if you're trying to build bone, if you're just doing one meal a day, you're not going to get enough nutrients that you need uh, to, to support that bone building plan. Okay. And then so prioritizing protein, at least two meals, maybe three meals, uh, splitting that up uh, between multiple meals and then getting other important nutrients too, like calcium. Now we talked about dairy earlier. If dairy is not in your plan, how am I going to get calcium, right? I have an autoimmune condition. How am I going to get calcium? Well, there are a couple of great things that you can add or incorporate. Number one would be small fish with the bones in. So these would be, yeah. you know, your canned salmon with the BPA free can, of course, but <laughs> canned salmon with the bones in, these are not hard pokey bones that are going to hurt your mouth. They, they almost, I'm not making the case for fish here. They almost melt in your mouth, right? Well, you know what? It actually, you can smush it. Like you can make it into like a salmon salad or something. It's actually, I've done this. It's, oh, I'm, I'm so much more utilitarian than you. <laughs> I'm just, just crunch I'm away. <laughs> eating it out of the yeah, can. No, I'm, I'm just not, such I'm a caveman. You. you know. Yeah, that's because uh, you're a dude. I, I, yeah. yeah. I need that I goes, need my capers and things like that. So <laughs> that's the marine stuff. Food with sustenance at a certain point. And you know, it's just I can just yeah, eat it right out of the can. Some people can't. You can drizzle some primal kitchen dressing on it or something to make it taste good. But anyway, the, the reason why you want to get the smaller fish is they're not going to have as many of the, the bad heavy metals that we wouldn't want in there. Uh, like mercury and gets the sardines, a uh, wild can sockeye salmon or pink salmon that have the bones in mackerel is another good one. And the reason I like these fish is because they have protein. Number one, mm -hmm. protein building blocks of, of your muscles and your bones. Uh, number two, they have calcium, but not just calcium by itself. Yeah. It's calcium and all the other minerals and nutrients in the right ratios that nature put them in. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you're getting. You're getting a good, healthy dose of that inside that the fish. And then the fish also have omega-3s. Mm -hmm. Omega-3s are like the dampeners of inflammation. So anything contributing to inflammation, especially when it's chronic, especially long-term, that's not going to be a good thing. So you get like a three, one, two, three punch there with, with just one food, which is great. Love okay. Uh, another one is arugula. I love arugula. It's so mm -hmm. easy to add. And this is a bioavailable form of calcium that's from a, a plant, right? From, from some leafy greens that actually taste good. Now, a lot of times people will look at spinach. If you're looking at a package, maybe you're going to the farmer's market, but maybe you have to go, to go to the grocery store, you see the package and it says, wow, lots and lots of calcium in spinach. Well, that calcium, there's also um, high oxalates mm -hmm. in spinach too. And oxalate's going to bind to that calcium. So it's not going to be bioavailable for you. Uh, so if you're wanting a lower oxalate green, especially if you have digestive issues, if you have a history of kidney stones, those kinds of things, swap that spinach for the arugula, right? Yeah. And the way you just incorporate it is you just yeah. toss it as you use it as a side salad, small amount, uh, put a little primal kitchen dressing, no affiliation. I just, it's an easy one. It's, a, right? it's an easy one and it's relatively clean. It's pretty good for you. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that arugula is actually a cruciferous vegetable. Yeah, it's, same it's, same cruciferous family as broccoli and kale. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But much easier to digest than kale for sure. Yeah. Um, although poor kale, you know, it was the golden child for so many years, and now all of a sudden it's been thrown into the ditch and rolled in the mud. And we're not yeah. going to go there because we don't have time for that. <laughs> but if you are going to do kale, so okay, curly for the kale love of God. <laughs> if you are going to do kale. Yeah, I would opt for the the dino or lacinato kale, which is lower yeah. oxalate than the curly kale. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and also um, having some that squeeze of lemon on your on your calcium rich foods because it'll help your body to take it in. What about bone broth? What are your thoughts there? Yeah. So there's no research that specifically says bone broth will help your bones, but the components of bone broth can obviously be helpful for your bones and your gut health too. Yeah. So yeah. I love it. I'm a big proponent of it. I think it's a fantastic addition, and it's easy. It's practical. Mm -hmm. You can go, um, one of the brands that I like uh, is, gosh, I can't remember the name Kettle right now, fire. but it's, uh, no, I, I that's the shelf brand. I'm thinking about the one that's in the freezer, Bonafide, I think is the name of it. Okay. But they have like grass fed, it's frozen. That's got a little more gelatin in it or a little more mm -hmm. collagen, it looks like. 
a little more. So if you set it on the counter, it's got a little jiggle to it. That's how yeah. you know. The more jiggle it has, the more collagen and gelatin it has, which is good. Uh, so I'll grab some of those and we'll use them in crock pot meals uh, with yeah. some, some meat, some veggies, or we'll do it in a, a, a slow cooker. Or yeah, what's the other yeah. one? What's the other one that you put the pressure lid on? Pressure cooker. cooker. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you use those and you're like, if you're saying, I don't have time to make a healthy meal. Well, yeah, you do. Take some bone broth, toss it in there, toss a little meat, toss a little veggies, leave it, go do your thing. You've got time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And if you're going to eat grains, if that's part of your plan, which it may be, even gluten free ones, cook them in bone broth. Like if you're going to yeah. cook rice, cook it in bone broth. Like it yep. just amp up the nutritional value, make it build yep. the nutrient density. Okay. So that's food and now exercise. You got what it. Exercise? What's 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 it going to take? Because it's not going to be walking around the block with your dog four times a day. Oh, it's not. Start, but it's, it's not, not. That's not going to build your bones. It's not. But remember what I said. The standard recommendation that most people are getting is calcium, vitamin D. Go for a walk. Take a bone drug. We'll see you in two years. Yeah. I'll tell you right now. Walking is not enough. Mm -hmm. Is it good? Should you be doing it every day? Yes. It's good for your health. You should incorporate it. At the same time, just understand that. When you're walking, you're walking in the same direction over and over and over again. You're only working your lower half, like your forearms, an area where a lot of people fracture. How much work is getting done with your forearm or impact are you having with your forearm when you're walking? None whatsoever, right? So we have to have other stimulus for different parts of our body too. Uh, so when we're talking about the stimulus that bones need, you need two different types. You need muscle pulling on bone yeah. and you need impact. The most effective interventions, you're going to use one or both of those things in combination. So when we have muscle pulling on bone, you have a mechanical signal that sends a chemical signal to tell those bones to become stronger. Okay. Uh, and then the, the different types of exercise, I'm going to go through each one. I'm going to go through weight-bearing exercise, non-weight-bearing exercise. I'm going to go through resistance training and strength training. So weight-bearing exercise is exercise that your, your body and your bones have to work against gravity to keep you upright. There are things that you're doing on your feet, and that is placing a good, healthy stress on the bones. So this is where walking would fall, weight-bearing exercise, walking, jogging, hiking, gardening, playing with the kids or the grandkids out in the yard, yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, Qigong. All of those things, notice not all of those are formal exercise. Some of it mm -hmm. can be fun and play, right? Yeah. So you can still get weight bearing, pickleball, yeah. right? Yeah. That's weight bearing. So that's good. We want to incorporate those things. There's also non-weight bearing exercise. This is where your body and your bones are not working against gravity to keep you upright. They're not placing that good, healthy stress on the bones. And this is what astronauts deal with when they go up into space. And when they, it's very much use it or lose it for your muscles and your bones. So if, you know, you're not putting that stress on your bones, you're going to, you're going to start to lose bone density. You're going to have a really hard time maintaining it and you certainly will not be building it. So what are the exercises that fall in that, that category? If you're doing long distance cycling, right? Yeah. Endurance cycling, especially long periods of time, uh, that could potentially have a negative impact on bone mineral density. Yeah. Uh, and then swimming also is another one, right? Swimming. Would exactly. Be That's the next big one swimming. Yeah. Now it is not to say that if you enjoy swimming to don't, don't do it. Of right. Course. If it makes you happy, if it brings you joy, if it's where you relax and unwind with your family and your friends, do it by all means, but don't get in the pool five times a week, do a couple laps, get out and say, I'm done with my exercise because mm -hmm. you're not. Mm -hmm. You haven't provided the stimulus your body and your bones need to not just become stronger, just to maintain even as you age, it becomes so much harder. So you have to have that stimulus and the other form of exercise, which is muscle strengthening and resistance training exercise. Mm -hmm. And that's where we bring in, you know, the barbells, the dumbbells, the, maybe it's the machines at the gym. If that, that's where your comfort level is at, if that's, if that's where you're going to start, or I really like variable resistance bands too, incorporating those into a plan. Yeah, I've got okay. one right here. Yeah. 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 So, so those can be fantastic also. Now, what are the exercises that are the big, the big ones that we want to incorporate squats, deadlifts, 
overhead presses, and I say overhead presses, as long as you don't have a fracture already, like a vertebral fracture, last thing you want to do when you have a vertebral fracture uh, that has not healed fully is to uh, put a heavy axial load on yeah. that. Right? That could lead to other vertebral fractures. But if you don't have those fractures, those are great exercises to incorporate. Also things like box jumps, right? Getting yeah. some of that impact in there. Or when you're out walking or moving, you can also, you don't just have to walk in the same direction. As long as you've got good balance, maybe you do some side shuffles or some uh, multi-directional impact type things, as long as you feel good about that. Uh, you know, it just depends on where you're at in, in your exercise abilities. Mm -hmm. Some people are totally comfortable with that. Some people are worried about, you know, falling and things like that. If you're worried about falling, doing a bunch of crazy movements and stuff while you're out walking, probably not the best idea, especially when it's cold out too. So, um, but if, if that's not an issue for you, by all means, go for it. And by the way, the, oh, the rep range, the mm -hmm. rep range that we want to be in. Yeah, the five to 10 repetition range can be a really, a really good range to, to be in, to help stimulate the muscle growth, the bone growth too. Yeah. The thing with the five to 10, I think is also to get heavy enough in that few reps, you kind of have to be at a certain level fitness wise so that you yeah. don't hurt yourself. So I think a big piece of this is understanding that you're going to have to start where you are and mm -hmm. work with someone who's skilled to help you to come along to where you need to get to. And one thing I've seen is, like I said, I mentioned my mom, like she had been diagnosed with, you know, osteoporosis. Like she was past, you know, she'd left planet osteopenia, was heading to osteoporosis, maybe had touched ground there. And she was experiencing severe pain in her hips from like she could, it was, in, it was getting in the way of her ability to walk comfortably. Um, yeah. And it just so happens that it, around the corner from her, there was a, a gym called Osteo Strong. And this is very specific gym. This gym is designed specifically for this purpose. And as an 80 year old woman, like it is remarkable how six months later, what a transformation it made for her in terms of not just her bone density, but how more much more functional she became. And And I think in her case, because she was already at a point where her bones had degraded to the point where they were weakening, she needed that kind of structure and very specific planes of like working out in certain planes and moderating the the weights yep. so that it would put enough stress to grow bone, but not enough that it would shatter something. Yeah, that's so important. And then and Ossia Strong uses the concept of osteogenic loading, and that's based on the work of Julius Wolf, where that that's where you're you're taking a force, you're loading a bone through its axis, and that's going to stimulate that bone to increase in density and strength. That's what that's all based on. And the way that Osseo Strong is set up is there are like four, um, four machines inside there. You go and you give a great effort and, you know, it helps stimulate that bone growth over time. Mm -hmm. It can also help with other things. Uh, I, a couple, uh, a couple things there. I actually think, I think it can be a great complement to yeah. uh to an already well-rounded plan too right you yeah. can't remember what i said you have to provide the stimulus so you are you do need an exercise plan in addition to something like that but you can't build that bone if you don't have the raw materials and resources needed to do so also so kind of just like when you take a medication you can't put all your faith in the medication because yeah. It's, it's just a medication it's not going to address the root cause issues not going to address diet and nutrition sometimes it can make those things worse same thing with <clears throat> exercise. You can't just exercise and then not get the nutrition that you need, right? So mm -hmm. there's multiple pieces that play into this. And a big one is if you are still actively losing bone right now, figuring out what the contributing factors are to that, and then slowly building your plan on that, and then adding in you know, these other complementary technologies and things like that, vibration plates, rebounders, you know, these are the most common things, oxygenic loading. Um, through Ossia Strong, these are the most common things I hear people uh, share. And I always encourage people get a foundational plan in place and then start adding in those complimentary things later on if and when it makes sense for your situation. Okay. So you run programs like this. So clearly your program speaks to, is is built around the foundation so that, yeah, you can add the vibration plate. You can add, I mean, the rebounder I think is really cool also for, because it's accessible. It's not a crazy expensive thing. You can have yep. it in your house as long as your ceiling's not too low because then you end up spinal injury, which is a different problem. <laughs> you know? I know. And if you, 
and just another note on that. So again, if you already have fractures you or you have really, yeah. or you have really poor quality bone, then you need to be really careful with the osteogenic loading. Uh, and then the, uh, like loading, loading a bone. If you've already got fractures like vertebral fractures, or you're at really high risk of hip fracture or something like that, you got to be careful with a rebounders and, uh, and, and loading the bone. Right. So just some important, important notes there. A hundred percent. So in your programs, what are you teaching people? Because I, my guess is you're hoping to get your hands on people before they've kind of fallen too far off where they need to be. Um, I mean, we, we see people at all. At every stage. Of the I mean, the twenties to mid twenties to mid nineties, most are women 40, 45 to 70, 50 to 70, somewhere in there. Uh, but we have plenty of people in the seventies to eighties too. Uh, some people have bone density in the negative ones. Some mm -hmm. are in the negative fives. Some have fractured no times and they're like, gosh, I'm relatively healthy. I just have this diagnosis. I feel like I'm eating healthy. I'm doing all the biohacking stuff. I'm, you know, doing all this great stuff. They don't really have a lot of other health issues. They're just trying to figure out what to do to optimize. Uh, then there are people that have 15 or more fractures, mm -hmm. right? They come see us. So there's a big spectrum there. The program focuses on getting the foundational plan in place that's right for you and your situation, where no matter where you are on that spectrum, and it covers all the important areas. So helping you figure out the root cause issues, monitoring those things over time with different markers that are, that are important, um, addressing the digestive health, the nutrients, all that kind of stuff through the lens of bone health also. Yeah. So, um, so we're making sure we're maximizing those nutrients and the raw materials and resources you need to build stronger, healthier bones. And then building strength of body, mind, and bone in a way that prevents fracture and injury. So reducing the stress, uh, stress has a, a big role in your bone health. If you are, if you've got a lot of stress, you need to, you need to get a consistent plan in place to bring that down. Uh, I think that's a lot of people beat that drum. There's another vote for it for bone health. Sleep is another one. We have to improve our sleep and it's pretty well documented. Poor sleep will reduce our bone quality. So you got to prioritize sleep, put the devices down a couple hours before bed. If you can, uh, make sure you get up, get early morning sun, even for a couple minutes, get outside, get some early morning sun. Even if it's cloudy out, it can yeah. still have a good impact on your circadian rhythm. Um, and then exercise, get the right plan in place. Now I listed off three exercises, right? And that can be intimidating for some people that have never done a deadlift and they hear deadlift and like, they think of the bodybuilder with yes. the big bar, yanking that up off the floor. And it's got the word dead in it. I know, right? That's just <laughs> not appealing. And it's whose idea of, was that? <laughs> it's kind of scary and intimidating. Yeah. And just like you said, we'll, we help people figure out what's the right approach, slowly get you up to where you need to be. We look at your body mechanics and then pain. Sometimes people just have pain not related to a fracture. It could be that they had a surgery a long time ago, or they've got neck pain, shoulder pain, back pain, knee pain, hip pain, foot pain, whatever that prevents them from doing exercise altogether or it compromises their body mechanics and puts them at greater risk of injury. So mm -hmm. we teach people how to navigate those things and just get the right stronger bones plan in place. So um, perfect. The last thing I, I know we, we have a hard stop and I want you to give people your information on where to reach you, but there's one thing we haven't mentioned yet that I think is really important. And it's yeah. the first letter of your name. And we've mentioned D3, we've mentioned magnesium, we've mentioned calcium, we haven't mentioned K2 and I and I don't know how many times I've busted clients, family members, friends are like, oh yeah, I'm taking my vitamin D. And I'm like, seriously, like you're taking D on its own? Like who does yeah. that? Yeah. Um, so from the bone coach, will you deliver the lecture? Maybe they'll believe you on K2. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you the most important reason. So uh you need to incorporate, yes, D3 is important. Uh, calcium is important. Magnesium is important. As you increase D3, uh, your, your vitamin D and calcium intake, so too does your need for magnesium. That yeah. goes up too. Most of us are already deficient. I, I think most health experts will agree you can get more magnesium and you need it to rebuild your muscles and your bones. So that's important. And then vitamin K2 is important. The reason for that is vitamin K K2 activates matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin, which is going to help build that bone 
and it helps the calcium go to where it's supposed to be instead of the soft tissues like the kidneys and the arteries where we do not want it to be. So you need to incorporate vitamin K2. Now you can get it from food, but sometimes supplementation is really helpful. Okay. So if you're getting K2, uh, MK4, that's one version of it. You can get K2 MK4 from things like beef liver, grass-fed ghee and butter, pastured egg yolks, emu oil. You can get it from those sources. K2 MK7, you can get from our cheeses, fermented foods, sauerkraut, kimchi, natto, uh, and even bacterial fermentation in our guts. But even with those sources, most people would benefit from uh, from adding in additional K2. Yeah. So. Yes, that's another that's another vote for K2 for sure. Well, and it's a fat soluble, it's one of the four fat soluble vitamins. So it's easy one when you're taking your D3, just make sure it has K2 with it. And then Yep, and make sure you take just like you said, those fat soluble nutrients, you need to take them with a meal. They're not something you just pop in the morning when you're drinking your water. It's not going to have the impact you want it to have. You got to take it with a meal. 100%. All right, Bone Coach, tell us where to find you and uh, how people can access your amazing stuff. Well, you can always find me at bonecoach.com. That is the best place to find all Stronger Bones resources, recipes, podcasts. My podcast with Nat is over there too. We talked about some really fascinating stuff with peptides and bone health. So check that one out for sure. Uh, I do have a Bone Coach osteoporosis podcast you can check out. And we're on all the major social channels at Bone Coach or at Bone Coach Kevin. Uh, But bonecoach.com is where you can go for the Stronger Bones programs. Amazing. Thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. And uh, I look forward to chatting with you again. Thanks, Nat.